All right. Yeah. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. So it's a, a really an immense pleasure. Welcome everyone this afternoon for uh, this Rosenthal lecture. Uh, and I have to say that the circumstances make it even more than the usual pleasure of the annual lecture, because I was actually looking back in my mailbox uh, about the invitation to, to Francesca, and it turned out that uh, she was invited in 2019 to give the lecture in 2020. And back at the end of January, we had the... Okay. Maybe I should speak yeah. louder, yeah. Uh, so I said that in 2000, and she was invited to be the speaker in 2020, and uh, we had the hotel and everything was set up, and she was supposed to talk at the end of March 2020, and so, you know, that didn't work out as planned, um, but, you know, we postponed it uh, until that would be able to, to happen again, and, and I'm very glad that, you know, this day has come and, and we're here uh, to welcome Francesca. So, uh, as a quick word of introduction, this is a little bit of a special uh, lecture. So every time that it's given, there's a, a, a little bit of, of historical context to that. And so the Hanan Rosenthal Memorial Lecture uh, was, was established in honor of uh, Hanan Rosenthal, a physicist. Uh, so there are only bits and pieces of information, but let me share with you uh, the, the, the bit that I know. So uh, Rosenthal was born in 1943 uh, in Tel Aviv, Yafo, in, in Palestine under British mandate at the time. The family uh, moved quite a bit in these early years. They moved to Germany in 1956. And then in 1957, uh, they moved to the US, uh, to Portland, Oregon, where that picture was actually taken. Uh, so this picture was shared by, uh, now, by Hanan's sister, Naomi, that, that you can actually see there. Uh, with father uh, Alfred and the mother uh, Gerda. Uh, and so um, Hanan was a, a graduate student at Columbia and an instructor at Yale uh, and passed away uh, in 1971 at the age of 27. And so uh, after his passing, the, the Rosenthal lecture was established uh, in his honor. And the first one was given in 1973, so two years after his passing, um, by uh, another uh, Italian uh, physicist, Ugo Fano. And, uh, and ever since, uh, you know, if you look at the, the, you know, the list of names, it's like some of the most distinguished atomic physicists have been invited. So at the time it was between uh, Yale and Columbia and for the past few years, it was only uh, done uh, at Yale. Um, so yeah, that's uh, for the Rosenthal lecture. Now, a quick introduction on on the speaker. Uh, so usually, you know, when you when you're a host and you welcome a speaker at, at Yale in New Haven, you know, one of the things that you end up doing was, you know, praising uh, New Haven and Yale and and talking about how amazing the the pizza are in New Haven, uh, un until the invited speaker is from Napoli, and then uh, you suddenly can't do that. Uh, so. Uh, Francesca's career actually uh, really mirrors uh, the development of quantum gases and ever since her early days as a PhD student, she's uh, over the past two decades of her career, she's made uh, you know, some amazing contributions to, uh, to the field. She's done some of the early works on degenerate uh, Fermi gases. Uh, after that, uh, so she did her PhD, uh, her, her undergraduate in, in Napoli. After that, she did her PhD in Florence, in Italy. Uh, and then after that, she moved for a postdoc in Innsbruck and actually stayed in Innsbruck uh, ever since. Uh, and she rose through the ranks and now uh, she's a, a university professor and scientific director at the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information in Innsbruck. Uh, and, and just to talk a little bit about the science that she's done, but she's going to talk about it a lot better than I do. Uh, in particular, in the past decade, uh, she's really been the pioneer in the field of, of quantum gases with dipolar interactions. So uh, interactions that are long range, strongly anisotropic. And, and some of her contributions uh, include the observation of a strange quasi particles called Roton and uh, a strange state of matter that's called super solidity, which features some features of, of superfluid flow and the rigidity of crystalline order. Uh, and so with this, uh, let me welcome uh, Francesca and thank you very much for being here. So, 
So thank you very much for uh, actually for having me here. It's uh, it's an enormous pleasure, and uh, I've never been here at Yale, and it's uh, it's an incredible place, and uh, it was so nice to to chat with many many group here, and uh, yeah, it it's really. I'm really very, very happy. And also for me, it's a very special occasion because uh, after COVID also in Europe, we didn't have a lot of opportunity uh, to, to give a talk and to wrap up on the work. I mean, although we were traveling not too much in the last two years, science actually proceeded much faster. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so today I would like to wrap on what we have been doing in the last, uh, in the last few years. Uh, but I mean, Nia, uh, which of course I would like to thank for hosting me so well. <laughs> thank you very much so far. And uh, so Nir told me uh, to make a lecture, let's say really starting from the basic. I mean, so, and now I would like to share with you what I think about atomic physics uh, and some step, how we build up step-by-step -step knowledge until the point to be able to do experiment, which really teach us something that were maybe unpredicted. And, uh, and so in doing this, uh, I start with one atom. So the you you know, I think especially for the younger person here in the audience. So maybe one atom, even if you, we think about the simplest one, hydrogen. So it's just one electron and one proton. Uh, one uh, might have the feeling that everything it's known about hydrogen. I mean, at the end, it's just one atom, and uh, yeah, so maybe not so interesting anymore. But actually. There is a whole universe inside an atom. And that's what I would like to bring you today. And the universe you can see is that if you now study this, uh, this hydrogen atom very closely, the first things you will discover, I mean, or have been uh, discovered, is that, I mean, if you try to do spectroscopy, let's say you want to measure the energy of the single atom, the simplest one, you see that the energy is quantized. And now this quantization was really the inspiring uh, observation to build on the law of quantum mechanics. Just one atom and give open the door to this quantum mechanic to quantize the energy level. But then, uh, I mean, uh, that's only uh, the, the first example. You can go on and then you say, okay, now in doing spectroscopy, people, uh, let's say, uh, became uh, better and better and then we're able to measure very tiny shift in the spectral line in particular one example is the lamp shift is a is a very small effect but actually is what gave and opened the door to the idea that the vacuum has fluctuation it opened the door to then uh, the quantum electrodynamic theory and those are just two examples from the past but you can think okay this is just the past now Everything is known nowadays, but very recently there was another mystery related to hydrogen and the spectral line, which was about the size of the proton. That was thought to have some given size, but then it has been measured back in, in Germany and, uh, and actually it turned out uh, to not have the size predicted. And the size is very important, how you define the, the size. And uh, also, I mean, uh, it tells you something about interaction that you have within one atom. Maybe there are new theory uh, behind your eyes zone. I mean, I think that this mystery is not completely settled nowadays. And, uh, but then this is more the inspiration of looking at fundamental physics. But then you can say, mm, look, I have now two level, it's quantized. Two level now can be, you know, a pendulum that kind of oscillate between two level. And so from this, you can think about building atomic clock in the even building it in the optical regime which is now the new frontier or you can think to have this two level and uh, and use it to encode information and now that's the let's say the uh, the establishment of what is uh, let's say now a very developing science in quantum computation two level atom and you can create superposition between these two discrete state and uh, and the superposition principle tells you that your power of encoding information in just a two level single object is much larger than using the equivalent for classical atom so here it's kind of in my from my point of view is a lot about i mean uh putting up example that goes from fundamental curiosity of how nature, let's say, work. You go from an atom and try to understand 
the, the law that govern and that make these atoms stable to up to a more and more application using what you have learned. But now this is only <laughs> one atom. And then uh, one could um, ask, okay, what happens if I put two? I mean, now you have to, to add another degree of freedom, which is actually the interaction between the atoms. And now if it's not only two, but you have few, more opportunity open and if there are more and even more at the point to have many and you are able to go in the quantum regime with all these atoms you may may be able to uh, undergo a, a phenomena which is called Bose-Einstein condensation. So this is really amazing from a conceptual point of view because now each of the atoms have lost their own identity they are not anymore distinguishable from the other. They start to become completely indistinguishable particles all together. And they all together can be actually completely described by a single order parameter, a single wave function that actually would encode the behavior of one million atom. We are now speaking in gas phase. Let's not think about a setting, but just, you know, you have these many atoms in a gas phase, they interact with each other and this interaction is relevant. And so you can think, okay, I can use a, um, an equation which kind of tells me what is the rules uh, this object should follow. And so it's a single wave function describing all these many atoms. Okay, it's a macroscopic quantum state. And now the keyword macroscopic and quantum state is really very important because suddenly you can also measure quantum phenomena at the macroscopic scale. So they become suddenly visible or very visible to you. And, uh, and so in this type of equation, you will have the kinetic energy. It's a gas, so you need to trap with some light or some magnetic field. And you then have very importantly this interaction. But actually before be able to study this many body quantum system, the way it's still very long. Why? Because you have few problems you have to take care. So the first thing is, uh, putting together numbers. Now let's try to be more quantitative. Now I have two atoms in my gas and my atoms are thermal. So let's say they have a huge kinetic energy. So this is the typical density of a gas, which is very dilute. In which sense? The, in the sense that their distance is very large comparing to the size of a single atom. So it's four order of magnitude. You know, it's like if you would like to see someone on kilometers distance, Okay, so you, you kind of, uh, it's very unlikely that by walking in the street, you will crash or collide with the person which is at kilometer distance from you. And that's the same sense of improbability or very low type of uh, uh, collisional mechanism that you have in this type of atom if you are in the thermal region. And actually thermal, it's very important because <laughs> Uh, if you now think also the type of interaction, you know, the type of interaction between atoms that would eventually bind the atom into molecule, this, the range of, a, uh, of this type of interaction in the classical regime is very small. I mean, there is three order of magnitude between the range of interaction and the distance, so they hardly see each other. And so that's a problem. How do, you know, we create a unique object with a million atoms that they are all together condensed if, uh, I mean, uh, with the numbers doesn't fit together, okay? And so it's very clear that if we want to enter in this interesting regime, what one would have to do, it's actually to decrease the thermal energy. So to cool down the system. And now, I mean, how to cool down? I mean, because the thermal energy for us, atomic physics is, uh, it's kind of a noise. So the particles are moving, they're smearing out. And so there is a way that actually uh, was developed by many group and gave rise to a Nobel prize in 97, which is called the laser cooling. So let's use the very strong interaction that one atom can have with light to actually slow down this atom to the point to remove a lot of kinetic energy and to cool down the atom. And uh, I mean, here, one has also to ask how much we should uh, cool down. I mean, when it's cool, I mean, when it's cold enough to enter the quantum regime. Well, here, there is another important quantity, which is the De Broglie wavelength. So as you know, and in old textbook, I mean, this quantum physics holds a lot in this duality between particle and wave. But when this happens, when this duality starts to pay any role. Well, you can always see even a classical particle as a wave. 
but just the size of this wave it's proportional to the inverse of the square root of the temperature so at room temperature this this wave is zero it has a, a absolutely no effect but if you now decrease uh, the temperature the de Broglie wavelengths can be very huge and suddenly you switch instead of thinking about your atom to be a billiard ball you start to think about wave it's like entering in a matrix type of uh, uh, dynamics and so suddenly your atom are much better described by a wave and this wave in the ultra cold regime that we typically reach in our experiment can be huge you know can be let's say on the order of the interparticle distance all these wave what do they do the wave when you have more wave together some in my, they can interfere and this constructive interference is another way to think about Bose-Einstein condensation, purely wave uh, effect. It's constructive interference. And now, since they are so diffuse and these waves are so big, also the interaction, uh, which is defined, it's uh, very big. And so the atoms start to interact with each other, to see each other. And interaction means also ex exchanging information between them. And uh, and so the type of interaction that we typically have in our, our ultra cold atom at the very low temperature, it's actually take a very easy form because it's an interaction coming from the Van der Waals potential, it's short range. It's only depending on a parameter, which is this A, called scattering lens. So it gives you somehow the range, the, the size of this green circle. And then is a delta function, which tell you is delta. So this interaction is only acting at very short range. Uh, if they are very separated, the contact interaction is not playing a big role. Is totally isotropic, is directional independent. So it's, let's say, it's kind of a spherical type. And you can actually tune the scattering lens. So you can make it very big using the trick of the so-called fano feshbach resonance. And Fano, you remember, was the first one giving the Rosenthal lecture here. And his work, which was in a completely different field than, uh, let's say, the one we are in, today it had a huge impact in all our experiments so how do we cool down i mean it's very difficult to explain every step but let's say i think that the dilemma was how to cool if our refrigerator is too warm i mean there was no classical idea of cooling you know typically you put something warm in something very hot and they thermalize and the temperature reduce but now there was no refrigerator able to bring this atom to the really temperature of nano kelvin so 10 to the minus 9 kelvin that we would need and so the, this is where laser cooling had a very huge impact and actually the way to cooling is purely quantum already. So just to make a sketch, that's more or less our experiment. Let's say from a point of view, you have a gas of atom, maybe you have a million of neutral atom in gas phase. You then have a box, let's say like the box of near, and uh, it's a trap. Uh, they're trapping this gas. You can do it with light or with magnetic field. Okay, you want to screen this from the outside. So you put it in a vacuum chamber which is this one, you want to have magnetic field control. So you add two coil more or less where a magnetic field can be generated. And then you have a bunch of laser, the, the blue one to cool down and also laser maybe to further trap the atom. And you have an RF antenna to let's say manipulate the internal state. So all I would say that from a very, uh, let's say a broad point of view, that's all what we need. Uh, how they look like in the experiment? Well, that's a little simulation. So now in our experiment, we have this, uh, let's say, beam of neutral atom, pretty hot, that are moving in a tube, which we call Zeeman's lower. And then these atoms are all moving in the science chamber. That this, this, I mean, now it's just a section that we would like to show. And here you have this uh, resonant laser light, uh, so uh, six of them that create the so-called magnetoptical trap where all the atoms that are coming, not all the atoms, a small fraction actually of the atom can be trapped by the magnetoptical trap. At this point, the temperature is micro Kelvin, way too hot, I mean, no wave. So you need to do something else. Now you see 
that's the, the so-called recapture volume of the magneto-optical trap. Many atoms are lost, are in the background, some others are still flowing in the main direction. And then at some point when you think, okay, now laser cooling did the good job that I would like, you switch off the resonant light and you go to off resonant light and you can so off resonant means very far away from any of these discrete energy level and so and here you can trap in one atom and you can start let's say your physics so what are our goal generally speaking in the community well we have many goals and we have many dreams are as in any <laughs> field of uh, of research um, but of course a very important driving uh, force was the idea to create new form of quantum matter or even uh, to think about phenomena in other field that we could simulate because this gas of atom we can control almost everything we can control the kinetic energy we can control the interaction we can control the dimensionality by changing the trapping or even to use this type of system like uh, with the prospect of uh, of building something uh, more uh, in the direction of quantum computer or to really try to observe uh, phenomena which are in book uh, very fundamental one maybe the simplest one that nobody had uh, observed but i think that beside the goal uh, what was really important is the philosophy that we have in this community and the philosophy is always to try to take ultra cold atom and to put a new regime and each time you enter in a new regime which might be a new regime of temperature a new regime of trapping a new regime in terms of potential of detection a new regime of interaction new discovery that nobody has predicted are coming up and this is, I mean, an example, for example, is the new regime that were enabled by the use of uh, ultra cold atom and, uh, and optical trapping, uh, like uh, optical lattice. So you can create with light in standing wave configuration, really two dimensional, three dimensional lattice and start model like Bose Abbard, Fermi Abbard model, which are uh, known in other fields. Or you can uh, even, you know, really try to observe at the single level, the behavior of the atom. You can observe single atom with this quantum gas microscopy which have been developed a few years ago and this new frontier of detection allows for example to observe an antipyromagnetic order in a gas in a lattice confined atom or you can even go farther you don't want to probe only the single atom but you want to you know control where it is and so here there are now a very huge increase of experiment in our community about the atom by atom assembler with this the optical tweezer that you really you know move and detect and act on a single atom as you as you want but there is another frontier that you could push and the other frontier is actually which type of atom you want to use I mean, many of the ultra cold, I mean, I already told you how important was the use of hydrogen uh, helium I don't have to tell you two electron fermions Pauli principle the discoverer of Pauli principle and what and the alkali are kind of the, the the most common atomic species used for all ultra cold experiment because they are very nicely uh, coolable with laser light but you can go also to more uh, let's say exotic atom and the periodic table is gigantic so and uh, and so our choice uh, in my group was to go to completely new type of atomic species, the one from the family of lanthanide that many colleagues in my field even didn't you know visualize immediately in the periodic table where lanthanide are are below. They are very much forget that. I mean, you have the nice the table, and then there is this two row poor guy below nobody <laughs> think about them. And indeed, also here they are isolated. What what? Wow, fantastic. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and, and those are beautiful atoms. You will agree with me. Uh, sorry? <laughs> Anyhow, I mean, for me as atomic physics, those are fantastic atoms. And actually, all the lanthanide are kind of a big family. The different uh, uh, um, atoms 
in the lanthanide series, they share a lot of properties because they have very similar electronic properties. So meaning the electron are behaving uh, very similarly. And so we were the first one. Uh, so the first one condensed uh, that was in the group of Benjamin Leff and Stanford with this prosium. And shortly after our group was able to both condensum erbium uh, uh, 10 years ago, we had the celebration recently, but this summer europium has been both condensed, for example. So the family is growing. And, uh, and why it's interesting, okay, here's what I just said, why it's interesting? Well, it's very interesting because these atoms have a special feature. They are very highly magnetic. So that means that uh, the vibration on your mobile phone is thanks to alloy of lanthanide atom, are the most magnetic atom of the periodic table. Okay, so you use it in technology all the time for having uh, any magnetic type of, uh, of phenomena. That's also the reason why with the smartphone, I mean, to buy Erbium and this prosum became more and more expensive, actually. <laughs> so that was the negative side. But why dipolar interaction is so interesting? Well, you see it maybe here. First of all, it's not short range, it's a long range interaction. You see also classically this little ball uh, they don't need to, you know, to, to, to enter in contact. But also what they do, they do some strange geometry, like maybe they pile up all together. And this is only classical magnet are the thing you can see any fantastic movie on YouTube about magnetic fluid or magnetic particle. But for us in the quantum regime, it's really about the fact that they are interaction effective at long range and the fact that they are directionally uh, dependent. So if two of our atoms are colliding, uh, let's say they are polarized like magnet like this, uh, they would feel a repulsive interaction. If now they are in this direction, they would feel an attractive interaction. And since nature for the second law of thermodynamics, uh, it's favoring uh, attractive interaction because it's decreasing the energy, there is a natural tendency for this atom to align, you know, in a gas phase. And this you have to keep in mind because this will be very important for the rest of the, of the talk. And now because of these properties and many more, which I don't have really time, although at the beginning there was only, you know, few group, I mean, working in this prosium and erbium, now this is really becoming a very, very interesting uh, direction in the ultra cold quantum gas uh, research. And there is, I mean, if you want to know more about uh, all the properties, there is now a review uh, in nature physics that tells, I mean, highlights the new possibility with this atomic species. But I mean, an example which is very easy to understand is that if they are long range, it means if I put each atom on a different lattice side, even if they don't move, if, even if they, uh, let's say, are very well separated on different sides of, uh, of a lattice of a crystal, they will interact with each other via the nearest neighbor long range dipole-dipole interaction. And this open all a bunch of new phases of matter which are not accessible without long range interaction. And so it's very interesting because this interaction act on the motion. So really, if they come together or are far away, so let's say the long range in the external degree of freedom, motion, movement in the lattice, tunneling, but it's also effective in the internal degree of freedom. So even if these two particles are physically separated in two different lattice sites, so they can do flip-flop, they speak to each other, their spin are little antenna, and they know about the existence of the other. So you can open all the direction of spin physics with ultra-cold atom, but having all the control typical of ultra-cold And uh, and another important thing I want to give now a more concrete example of what we have done recently is that the dipolar interaction is not only effective in lattice, let's say discrete structure, but also in the bulk in the continuum. And so the long range interaction will really bring uh, all a new type of correlation between the atoms. And uh, what is also very important in our system is that on the one hand, we have the 
magnetic interaction long range. On the other hand, we still have the short range interaction. So you suddenly have two sources of interaction that you can independently manipulate. You can make them equal. You can make them competing to each other. You can make them canceling each other. And it's in this fine tuning of interaction that new phase of matter can appear. And uh, that's what was the key ingredient of one of the key ingredients for, let's say, the observation in dipolar quantum gas of a very special phase of matter. And now I would like to take a moment because the story is very interesting and also connect with one of the Yale <laughs> faculty uh, of previous year. Um, actually, the super solid state was kind of predicted theoretically in 57. And it's a strange state because it do not follow the classification of state of matter. Now, if you try to think it's a state that has together the rigidity of a crystal, and at the same time, the particles are flowing like in the superfluid. I could not depict with my pen any state like this. And the easiest way I found to visualize this state in which is not too fluid, but it's every particle is simultaneously localized and simultaneously is flowing is one oddity for our intellectual imagination. And the best way I found to visualize was to go back to a Greek god, Gynus, that is simultaneously looking at the future and at the past. And you cannot break this god because otherwise he will die. And so that's for us a visualization of a super solid state, which is simultaneous fluid and has a, a, a crystalline order. And now let's see a little bit uh, more in detail. Uh, this was observed using dipolar gas uh, many years after in 2019 uh, by my group and by also other two groups, uh, one the group of Tillman Fau in Stuttgart and the other one of Modugno in Pisa. And so what we actually see in our experiment is that you have a gas of a million atoms and spontaneously is a gas, spontaneously is not caring anymore about the the shape of the trap, the gas is making periodic structure. They self-organize in this periodic structure, but simultaneously all the gas is super fluid. And so what about the story of superfluidity? I mean, it's a very interesting one because uh, so, since it's such an ambiguous state and uh, also a bit paradoxical, so it was not so, let's say, straightforward uh, to convince the community that this type of state should exist. And we go back to the 57, where actually there was uh, Penrose and uh, Ossinger pointing out that superfluidity flowing, the localization, and localization, crystalline order, are two competing order. And so because of these two competing order, they cannot coexist at the same time. And this was back in the 56. And then, I mean, more or less uh, one year after Gross and then uh, other theorists later showed that actually quantum mechanically, there is a state actually, quantum mechanically, is it possible? So mathematically, there is a, a state that could have both property at the same time, both crystalline order and Bose-Einstein condensation. Uh, this was a very exciting, uh, let's say, a theoretical debate in this year. And uh, what was the idea, the idea at that time uh, and what the prime candidate? So the prime candidate, the concrete candidate to see this type of state uh, were putting out by uh, Leggett uh, and, uh, and others, uh, thinking about actually solid helium. Really, you have helium four in solid state. And now the idea was that helium is organized in a crystal pattern. You have vacancy. And now these vacancy are actually mobile. And so the movement of these uh, vacancies couple somehow uh, to the movement of the atom, because if a whole move, uh, the atom should take its place. And this coupling would create a sort of super solid state. And, uh, and actually in the experiment, this put a, a lot of, you know, there was a different wave of time where the interest in the community start to go up and down. And actually in 2004, there was a paper from Kim and Chan seeing, uh, using, uh, an oscillator that there was some uh, effect huh? so that the moment of inertia of the system was dramatically changing here at a given temperature. 
And this dramatic change of the moment of inertia, which is basically the equivalent of a mass in a rotational motion, uh, was connected to the decouple of some particle from the whole. And this decoupling would be the supersolid state. And, uh, and this was in 2004, and there was a lot of attention and also enthusiasm, but also some criticism about this paper. And many, many different groups uh, tried to reproduce. And actually, some of them saw this type of effect, but the decrease, uh, uh, the amount of decrease was very dependent on the experiment. So this was already a bit, um, let's say, concerning. There was not really a universal, consistent picture about this effect. And then, I mean, there was really, it's very exciting to, to learn about the history of, uh, of, this, uh, of this research because many, really the community put together to try to explain this type of uh, phenomena. And then there was in 2007, Day and Bemish that actually measure another type of properties, which is the shear modulus related to the elasticity. And they actually saw that also the elasticity of solid helium were undergoing at the same temperature, also a very strong change. And there, there was extremely confusing what is going on, the torsional, the frequency of the torsional pendulum, but also the elasticity is changing. Is this at all connected with super solidity or something completely uh, different? And then uh, just a few here uh, after, uh, let's say on the one end, uh, they, the community came to the, let's say, to the conclusion that this change was due to, uh, let's say, structural properties and not related to super solidity. And then Kim and Chan repeated their experiment, but with much more sensitivity and advanced technique and could after, uh, after let's say, came to the conclusion that towards in their experiment, there was no super solidity. And I think I like to give this example because it also shows how scientists, how we as a scientist, we are faced to problem phenomena that we don't understand. And we really honestly try our best to explain this phenomena, but sometimes the things are too complicated. There are other source of phenomena playing at the same time that we do not think about. But what it's very important is to have a community that try to explain together this phenomenon. And it's very important then to redo this type of uh, experiment. And then uh, the, the point of view changed a little bit. Uh, instead of searching super solidity in a solid, there was trying to search a solid in a superfluid. Okay, so the idea is that you will have a fluid like the sea, and this sea would spontaneously do organize in a, this type of pattern with a very specific pitch, which repeat periodically. So it's a periodic, well-ordered phase of a fluid. And now in cold atoms, since we have such a high uh, degree of control, uh, it was thought that this was a good idea to think about cold atom. But at the beginning, it was not very clear what's the best, uh, well, what are the ingredients. Now we know, and I will tell you, but at that point also, what would be the, the real system to so this state was not clear. And uh, for us, uh, what is now we know is that you need a superfluid state and some interaction, which is momentum dependent. The momentum dependence on the interact, uh, so the long range nature of the dipole-dipole interaction, if you do a Fourier transform, it means that the space is converting in momentum and you have an explicit dependence on momentum in trapped system. And so it's this explicit dependence that is playing a very important role. And so now what we see, this is a, actually uh, the little ball, uh, it's illustration, but the, a profile is our calculation. So we start with the dipolar BEC, so it's super fluid that you can uh, study it. It's totally phase coherent. So all these atoms are locked in phase described by just one uh, wave function. And then, and then my, my thing is not working anymore. So I will change it. going on. Sorry for that. Uh, 
is my computer? Ah, maybe my computer is blocked. It's even worse than what I thought. Sorry. Uh, what do I do? Hmm? I should restart it here. Uh, but I assume it will not accept. Put back into Sorry, I need to restart everything. Ah, and now everybody. So a small break. <laughs> so, so, I'm sorry, my computer is exhausted. It's jet lagged. <laughs> like. Uh, can you call it, uh, connect on Zoom? Maybe you save me some time. Is your sick uh, someone sick? But no, but, uh, the last going as fast as I can. Yeah, can you give me again the last? Yeah, I'm back in Zoom. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now I should be back here. Yeah. And then I should also be back here. Try to do as fast as possible. <laughs> Can I remove this from us? Yeah, but now the cable. I'm sharing the no, I don't change the slide. Okay, yes, yeah, so and what we <clears throat> Then observe it is that we start with these uh, dipolar gases. Uh, sorry, I'm re <laughs> and uh, and then we change it some parameter, and so and what we saw is the phase transition to the state which is modulated. And what are our observable actually? We can really see in situ 
So we see the maximum of this density. And so spontaneously, this gas uh, can create this type of pattern. And very recently, we also observed this uh, kind of very beautiful hexagon pattern uh, with several droplets in a two-dimensional geometry. So now we don't even have this uh, breaking of the translational symmetry in one direction, but actually also in two directions. And this is more to look at the structure, let's say the periodicity of the state. Of course, it's a finite uh, size state, uh, but how do we probe the phase coherence? Well, I told you, I mean, you can visualize everything in terms of matter wave. So you can use the idea of interference and thus in, you can make an experiment to look at the matter wave interference because all these little wave will interfere and then you have, let's say, an interferometric signal like this one. And now if you repeat the experiment thousand, a hundred million of times, the interference speaker will always look at the same, the, exactly the same. It's very phase robust and you can extract the phase and you see that the phase is all uh, in one space. And so for the phase diagram, how what is determining this phase transition? Well, in this type of experiment, we started from uh, Bose-Einstein condensate and we changed one of the interaction, the contact one. We made the contact small such that the long range interaction is becoming more and more important. And now by moving in this direction in the phase diagram, that's where we found that let's say the super solid state. And indeed you see here, here we are decreasing the scattering lens and at some point this uh, density modulation is start to appear. Because of our observable, we can monitor the phase modulation, uh, which is, uh, so the amplitude modulation, so how much the density wave uh, is forming and also the amplitude of the phase coherence in these two colors. And then actually we can also go in a phase in which this little, uh, so the, 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 the modulated uh, state become more a collection of little gaseous droplets here. Yes. No, this one is a, a calculation for the infinite uh, size system that have this very sharp transition, but for finite system, everything gets a little bit smooth out. And so now one can ask what is the origin of the of the super solidity? Well, I told you already that you need a momentum dependent interaction. Since the interaction is momentum dependent, if you look at the dispersion relation, you have also that the excitation spectrum is momentum dependent. And, a, and this is very relevant because this make uh, that for dipolar gas, uh, the excitation spectrum has a minimum, which is called a droton. And if you know and remember the spectrum of excitation of superfluid helium, this superfluid helium, completely different system, also have this droton minimum. What is the impact of having a minimum? It means that if you excite an atom or a gas or a system at this specific wavelength, doesn't cost too much energy to excite the system. So there is a specific momentum at which if you kick your system, the energy cost is very little. And so this was a, and I mean, that's the idea of the roton excitation is like having a little density ripple, but this is an excitation. So the ground state is completely unmodulated at the moment. So we are looking at excitation on top of the ground state. And now this was predicted uh, uh, 20 years ago and after and 15 years after the observation, we would was able with some spectroscopic method to really see for the first time this type of proton excitation. But now I pose you a question to you somehow. And what happens if this roton touched zero is completely softened? So it means that any small fluctuation, there is no energy cost to create this excitation. So then what you would expect uh, is that any small excitation will then, you know, it's so easy to excite the system that maybe it will even collapse. It's extremely unstable because it's very easy to create this type of ripple and excitation. And actually what we observe, and we even didn't understood at the beginning what it was, that suddenly for some value of the scattering lens, because that's the control parameter to soften the rotom, we see the appearance of this very clear interference pattern in our gas. And then what we see even more surprisingly, uh, we we were expecting the system to collapse, to explode, because I mean, uh, since it costs no energy, then uh, this excitation would, you know, exponentially diverge. 
but actually what was seeing is that this aside peak had a very fast growth and then a very slower dynamic. And so this lower dynamics actually was pointing out that there is another mechanism stabilizing this system. And so and this is the role of a new term in the Hamiltonian we didn't know about, which are quantum fluctuations. So, and this is, I mean, uh, how this was observed. Uh, and, uh, and actually we could study more about the density modulation and the global phase coherence, because the, each of these property has, let's say, is a symmetry in the system that break. Now for each symmetry in a system that break, new branch in the excitation spectrum should appear. And so and now this is what you, you see is that if you have an unmodulated Bose-Einstein condensate, you have the roton, which I told you, then the roton gets softened and at the point of the super solid transition, there are two branches appearing here. And actually you see the periodicity that remind you what you can see, let's say in the band structure of, uh, of a solid state system. And so, and then uh, when you, one of the branch gets softer, which is the branch for the superfluid. And um, now I don't go really in the detail, but these are the type of branch are about this type of motion, like the accordion motion, a crystal, <laughs> let's say, moving motion. And this one is a, the, the lower branch, which is the one related to superfluid, is flow of matter between uh, this peak of density. And we could see in the experiment really the appearance of these two modes from a, a BC where you had only one to the super solid state. Now I don't have a lot of time. I think I'm very short, but let me uh, maybe just uh, show you that this way of producing the, the super solid in our system was about changing the interaction. So you start from a superfluid, you go to a system which breaks translational symmetry. But there is also another way to do this. And the other way is directly cool the system, so decrease the temperature into the super solid state. You are super solidifying in some sense or condensing in a super solid state. And so now you can see instead of the usual Bose-Einstein condensation. That's really the first image uh, that we, we saw. We started with the thermal cloud. You see the distribution is very broad and very uh, diffuse. And then you see this little peak appearing that's kind of a condensed atom in the usual type of peak. But then here you hardly see, but there are these two little bump uh, on the two sides, which is really, again, uh, this kind of interference pattern that I show you with the different imaging. So this uh, was maybe at the beginning, uh, you know, we thought, okay, maybe it's aberration, maybe it's not really physical, but then we implemented the new imaging setup. And now by decreasing the temperature, you really see in situ the appearance of the super solid state. And of course, there is a lot that you can study. So you can ask yourself which of the two symmetries breaking before, or you can even ask what is happening if I take a superfluid and I'm heating up. And this is a very new surprising result that we found that by starting with the state which have no density modulation, but very cold, uh, unmodulated superfluid, by heating up, we get a crystal. So which is very counterintuitive. And we are working with theoreticians to try to understand the region. And that, of course, the second question is whether we can make this uh, dipolar super solid scalable. I mean, you saw just few density peak. Can we make it bigger? Can we make it not only 1D, but two-dimensional? And we were ma very much, you know, driven by the discussion with two theorists, Russell Bissett and Luis Santos, and actually also by work ion in a trapped ion. Each of these now spot is one single ion. And now, what they found is that a string of ion, just by changing the transversal confinement, let's say relaxing, making larger, you see uh, that this type of zigzag configuration start to appear. And so this is a structural quantum uh, uh, phase transition in an ionic Coulomb crystal. And we thought maybe we can have something similar, but actually in our super solid, if we start with the string and we just make it larger, the confinement, so we end out of the super solid. It's a normal Bose-Einstein condensate. So we had to understand that it's not only important the trapping frequency, but also the atom. And, uh, and then uh, we upgraded the system to have larger atom number. And so now you see how the strings start to get two 
and then you get this zigzag type of configuration. You can even increase more, or you can even go to this two dimensional uh, state, and uh, which can have a very different geometry. And uh, now I have no time, no? So, I've... <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. So, and uh, uh, I just flash, but I don't go in the detail that actually at the moment, we, what we are studying uh, is uh, rotational properties of this gas. In principle, what is very interesting now that you have this cylindrical geometric state is to try to make vortices, quantized vortices into the system. And now this is uh, a direction which is going on now. We just... Uh, were able to produce vortices uh, in uh, a normal VC, and we are now working to try to get the vortices in uh, in uh, a modulator. Just let me show the video of the vortex uh, in a normal Bose-Einstein condensate. We have found a, a way to magneto steering, uh, so to rotate due to the magnet the system. And you see that there are a number of vortices, quantized vortices that are appear in the low density region of a normal dipolar BC, and now it takes a while. The vortices try to enter in the high density, but they, you know, there is kind of an energy protection. But eventually, after some time, what you observe is that the vortex are entering into the system. And then, if you would uh, decrease the temperature, the ground state will have a very specific pattern. And this is what we observed very recently also in our experiment, although we have a limited, uh, uh, let's say, resolution at the moment. You see how the gas is getting a bit spiralized, losing uh, matter from the side, and then you see the appearance of this vortex that then eventually enter into uh, the system. And so this is just to give you some, some really flash of example of what are Let's say, what is the journey when you start with the novel atomic species or when you try to push the frontier in what it's known by taking a completely different point of view? But this is just one type of added value. But you can also have other type of physics uh, uh, to be done with this magnetic atom. So instead of having only one atom, you can create a magnetic mixture by combining erbium or dysprosium. You actually, this atom have a clock transition, which might be very interesting also for fundamental physics, or you can study uh, multi-electron Rydberg excitation, where now the core uh, have so many electrons that you can manipulate differently the core of a Rydberg state and the electron. So this is really a flash and there is this review if you're interested on the many properties of lanthanide from our perspective that I would suggest. And before finishing, I would like again to thank Sneer and everybody here for hosting uh, me and having inviting me. And of course, I would like uh, to say thanks <laughs> to the leader dive all that, you know, compose uh, the group. And uh, yes, and so of course, uh, uh, I mean, uh, those are the people that make really the science uh, happening uh, in our lab. And we have also now a theory division and many collaboration uh, uh, with the external group. And actually we have here also a Yale student that spent three months with us uh, enjoying, uh, I really, uh, we really enjoy the time with him. And I would like to, you know, thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much for uh, such a dense talk. The floor is open for questions. Uh, so thank you very much for that talk. Um, you didn't say much, I mean, you covered an amazing amount, but you didn't say much about the trap. How much does uh, the fact that the gas is in a harmonic trap affect the crystalline order that it tries to realize um, is that like is the stru crystal structure that you're seeing influenced by that? Would it look very different in a flat bottom trap? Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, let's say the trap has an important uh, an important role is one term of our Hamiltonian. So if we change this term, uh, the phase diagram is changing. So one phase uh, can move uh, for different value uh, of the scattering. The key point is that. Uh, 
let's say the roton minimum uh, it's determined as a minimum of the full of all the term of the hamiltonian so the trap uh, is also changing another very important role of the trap is that the dipolar interaction let's say in a three-dimensional uh, system is both attractive and uh, repulsive so now if we make an integral you lose the directionality if it's in a sphere let's say but now the trap is determining uh, uh, the um, volume of integration of the dipolar interaction. So it's favoring more the attraction or more the repulsion. So you can, you know, manipulate this volume of interaction of the dipolar by, by changing the trap. And that's very relevant because you can make it dominantly attractive, dominantly repulsive. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, maybe I have, I have one. Um, actually related to what Jack was, was talking, maybe you covered that a little bit, but what actually fixes the, when you break the symmetry to the crystalline structure, what actually controls the, the length scale? And can you actually change that? The length scale of? The length scale of the, of the crystalline structure of the blob in situ. Okay, so the, the density, the modulation exactly. uh, wave. Yeah. Uh, let's say you can change this in different way. Uh, you can change it by squeezing different. So by changing this volume of integration, let's say squeezing more or less uh, uh, the trap, you can change by changing the scattering lens of your system. Also this moving. Yeah. Hi, uh, how are those uh, measurements performed of the density in, of the atoms in the trap? Uh, yeah, so uh, you need to have uh, an objective uh, which has, um, let's say, high resolution, let's say not microscopy type resolution, but high resolution, let's say, uh, that you would be able to see a resolution of, uh, of alpha micron more or less. And then uh, you basically start to collect, so you, you shine resonant light and you uh, collect, uh, let's say, photon uh, which have been absorbed and remitted. Hi, um, sorry, a bit more of a like theory question, but uh, so you, at some point you showed us some, uh, if I understood correctly, a zero temperature phase diagram. And there's some phase transition happening to this new uh, uh, phase. Is there hope of some new um, critical point somewhere in this phase diagram? Um, so another order that would break, you mean? Like uh, like where the, you have some critical phenomena, you have like correlations diverging, like, uh, like informal stuff. Uh, so. Um... So this phase diagram, as you said, is uh, is the zero temperature phase diagram uh, of the system, and um, yeah. So could you find like a quantum critical point somewhere in that phase diagram? Yeah, this one. Yeah, this one. Uh, so now at the moment, those are the three phases that uh, that we could spot. But now uh, the question is, what happens in the phase diagram where you put the temperature as a? No, as I'm another... talking still at zero temperature. Is there a point where like? You have a critical, you have critical behavior. So, yeah. not that at the moment it's uh, it's known. I mean, uh, all what was observed is, uh, let's say, that you can change the phase transition from first order to second order depending on, uh, let's say, the the parameter that you put uh, inside the atom number and so on. Uh, but this is uh, pretty much what uh, what is known on this uh, on this phase transition. And another. Uh, somewhat related question there's some um um there's some uh phases there's, there's some quantum critical uh phases uh sorry points where it's sort of believed that unlike usual um unlike the usual story if you turn on temperature you sort of go to an ordered phase rather than a disordered phase which is kind of like this uh thing you were saying it was surprising that you turned on temperature and you had this order so maybe there's some relation that's i guess a comment yeah that was, i think it's interesting the temperature axis yeah. 
which is now uh, to do this calculation at finite temperature is not so easy. There are some stochastic model to do this, let's say stochastic GPA equation or to try to have some type of extension of Bogolubov theory with temperature. And that I think there, there is a lot to be still understood in the temperature axis. But all this is three-dimensional. Now I think that maybe some critical uh, divergence of correlation or this type of phenomena. Now in 3D, I don't think that there will be a lot in this direction, but maybe if we, you know, repeat this type of experiment, a more 2D system uh, or some uh, logarithmic divergence that can appear, then maybe the situation will change. But this is fully unexplored at the moment. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, if not, let's uh, thank again Francesca. Thanks.